Hey, good morning. Welcome here to Oasis Church Online. My name is Adam. I'm a part of the staff team, and I'm so glad that you are joining us today. Hey, if you missed our Good Friday or Easter Sunday services, I hope that you go and check out our messages on YouTube. I felt like there were such great explanations of the cross and the resurrection and why they still matter for life today. More than that, we have our songs and our services on our YouTube channel, and we have some great resources on our website for you as well. For married people, for people struggling with finances or mental health, even parenting, it's all on our website at oasischurch.ca slash resources. I hope you go and take advantage of that. We have a great service plan, and I'm so glad that you're here joining us. So let's get started. I'll see you on the other side. Welcome here to Oasis Church. My name is Adam. I'm on the staff team here, and I am so glad that you are joining us today. Whether it's in person here or you're tuning in online, you made it. You're at church, and it's going to be a good Sunday. Well, before I let you know about what to expect in this service, I want to tell you about Alpha. We are hosting a new Alpha. It's going to be an eight-week course starting May 1st. It's going to be on Wednesdays. And Alpha is a great opportunity to be introduced into the Christian faith and to wrestle with the big questions that you may have surrounding faith and life in general. And you get to do that in a safe space in community. So maybe you're thinking Alpha might be for you. Well, you can scan the QR code in front of you if you want to sign up. Or if you have more questions, the people at guest services behind would be more than happy to talk to you about it. Now, here today, uh, we'll be here for about an hour, and we're starting a brand new teaching series called Our Origin Story with our lead pastor, Dustin. And we hope it addresses for you some big questions like, why am I here? And does my life have meaning or purpose? And actually, I think this first song that we're about to sing, it speaks to some of those questions really well. It tells us about how important we are to God, the great lengths that he went to declare his love for us and to invite us into his family. And that is the basis of all of our identity. So if you're able, I hope you stand and join us. We have Kennedy, Arnold, Lauren, and Chanson to lead us as we sing. Here we go. Just 
think of myself, I know exactly what you see. Every flaw, every blemish, the scars of my hurts and my mistakes, the things I've done to myself, the things that have been said and done to me, that's who I am. You see a mother, daughter, sister, an aunt, you see the scarce shadow of a woman's potential irreversibly wrapped in failure. But then I hear it. That still, small voice. Who told you that? Who told you that you are defined by your mistakes? Who told you that you are ugly and broken? Who told you that you are only measured by what you give others? Who told you that brokenness and frailty are what you carry? 
Haven't you heard? You are not what everyone says you are. You are who God says you are, and you are His. He says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. He says you are a perfect design, made for a purpose, made for a destiny, and you are never alone. He says he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He goes before you. He goes behind you. He says you are bold. He says you are brilliant. He says you are brave. He says greater is he that is in you. You are a masterpiece, hand-painted by the master himself. You are who God says. You are. Why don't you sing this with me? You don't just tolerate us. You don't have somewhere to go. We're not your trophy children. Bending when we roam, your mercy is not a favor, and your presence isn't rushed. Oh, our God is love. The cross was not a vehicle for you to find me care. When we took upon your character, your grace was always there. Acceptance not withheld from us, no need to measure up. Oh, our God is love. His arms are open for all to gather here. The cross has spoken. There's nothing left to fear. Once and for all.
Father, we thank you for your incredible, amazing, great love. God, we pray like Paul prayed for the Ephesians, that we might be able to grasp just how high and how wide and how deep your love for us is. We thank you that it is not because of who we are, what we've done, or where we're going. It is because of who you are. And so we can trust that that will never change. Your love for us is secure. We pray these things for pleasure in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you can go ahead and have a seat, but watch out for these. You may need them. I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. They're here because you are invited to a dessert party. We're going to be having these all across the city, and uh, we hope that you take advantage of them. We know that we all need community, but it can be a little bit intimidating to start to build relationships with new people, right? Our hope is that uh, this is something that can break down a few of those barriers and help it feel a little bit more approachable for you because we've all understood the negative effects of isolation, but we think that spending some time together is something that we all need. So we hope you take advantage of this. We don't need any more hosts, so the big ask is done. We need a lot of people to attend, so maybe you might feel uh, compelled to join us. We hope that you take advantage of this. You can fill this out and hand it to somebody in the lobby, or you can sign up online as well. Uh, we're going to transition now our worship into a time of generosity, and every once in a while we tell you uh, about some of the other things that happen here beyond our Sunday mornings. We give you a little bit of a sneak peek, and today I'd like to share with you some of the stuff happening at the living room, which is our young adult environment for people age 18 to 25-ish. Uh, affectionately, we call it TLR, and here on Thursday nights throughout the university school calendar, and then varying events throughout the summer, young adults get to experience connection and uh, a great chance to build relationships, grow spiritually, be mentored, and wrestle with some of the big struggles of their faith. And we always serve them a meal there as well. Uh, and this is such a critical season. There are some young adults who have their careers all planned out, but maybe they're realizing it wasn't as fulfilling as they thought it was. Some people are still trying to figure out where their life is going and what they're doing with it. Some people are married, and other people thought they would be married, and, and things still haven't happened yet. And every one of them need this place where they can wrestle out the challenges of life in the context of faith with support from people who love them. Well, and if you give here, you help support environments like TLR, where young adults can have that support and encouragement. So thank you. For those of you who'd like to give today, we'll give you a moment to do that now. Thanks again for your generosity. From Genesis 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the heaven, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. 
God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. We continue with the last verse of chapter one into chapter two. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is God's word. Well, hey, welcome here. We are starting a new series on Genesis today, the very start of the Bible. And so if you've ever picked up your Bible and said, I'm going to read this, start to finish, uh, this series is for you because sometimes we don't get very far. It's it's, uh, very interesting writings to us. And and we're going to look in this series uh, just at Genesis 1 to 11. That's kind of a, a little bit of a chunk all of its own before we get to the story of this guy called Abraham in Genesis 12. Uh, And Genesis is an amazing book. Uh, The gospel, the story of what God does to redeem us, begins in Genesis. We're going to look at that in week three of this series. And any sermon I give you is obviously incomplete. Like, I'm never giving you all that can be said about any verse. But this is especially true of Genesis 1 through 11. There's just so much to say here. So I'm going to be assigning two bits of homework today. One of them is just the first part. I hope you read this for yourself. Pull out Genesis 1 to 11 and read it for yourself because Genesis is all about life. I was so privileged to study under an amazing, amazing teacher, a guy named August Conkle. If you ever get a chance to listen to one of his courses, uh, don't miss it. He's now a professor at McMaster Divinity School um, in Hamilton. But uh, he, he, he talked about Genesis as the book of life. And it's all about where life is found. Where's the, the good life? And Genesis speaks to us specifically, the message of Genesis is about how are we supposed to live in relationship to God in relationship to each other, and relationship to the world he's made. That's what Genesis is about. How, how, do we, how do we live? How do we live in relationship to God, to other people, our wives, our kids, and, and also this universe, the, the, the environment he's created? So today, Genesis 1, and Armando read for us some of uh, the creation account, uh, the start of all life. And as soon as you hear what he's talking about, as soon as you hear words about creation, immediately, living when and where we do, living in our era, Uh, we immediately ask, what does this have to do with science, right? What does this have to do with evolution? What does this have to do with biology or paleontology? And so let me start today by talking to you about what Genesis is not saying, okay? Because you don't get very far if we read our own questions into a text and we try to get a text to answer questions that it's not even um, answering. Now, for some of you today, maybe you've grown up in church, this may rattle you a bit, okay? And I hope it leads to maybe further study and further questions. For many of you, it will be liberating because you'll realize maybe the Bible is not uh, forcing us to fight, fight battles that it's not even commenting on. All we really know from Genesis 1 uh, is, is about how God creates is that, one, he speaks. That's how powerful God is. He speaks, and all of a sudden, matter begins to exist. And he creates out of nothing. Uh, the, the, you maybe heard the phrase ex nihilo, which is this way to say out of nothing. God speaks, and all of a sudden, boom, things exist. That's how powerful 
But Genesis does not tell us how this actually happened, how the atoms formed. It's, it's, it's not giving us a lab report, right? And it actually doesn't tell us when this happened. We're not told the timeline of this. Genesis is not a science lab report. It's actually concerned with something far, far, far more important than that. And, and, and some of you are already mad at me, okay? Hear me out, okay? Just hear me out, okay? If you have ever read this, you know the complexities, Sometimes people get mad at me when I say things like this, and I said, have you ever read Genesis? Because if you read Genesis 1 and 2 strictly, literally, you run into a number of big problems. Here's two that you see. First of all, in Genesis 1, uh, human beings are made last after Earth's vegetation. In Genesis 2, humans are made first before Earth's vegetation. And so the writer obviously is not putting these back to back to, you can't read them strictly, literally. It doesn't make sense. Second, some people are really, you know, about the the days of creation. Uh, Humans have always measured days of the relation of the earth to the sun, right? Or the, the, the earth's rotation or, you know, vice versa using language, phenomenological language that describes what we see, you know, the sun's rotation around the earth is how they would have said it back then. Um, the sun and the moon aren't made until day four. So I don't know how, how uh, you have days, right? And so just please hear, Genesis is not a lab report. And it doesn't tell us how old the earth is. If you were a rec- uh, reader of Maclean's magazine, a great Canadian magazine, in 1999 it had this article, The Forests of the Pasts. And this is an article about an island up in the uh, Arctic, okay? And so this is Canada. This is Axel Heiberg Island, which this article is about. We are way down here. We think we live in the far north, okay? This is Winnipeg <laughs> down here, okay? This is way above the Arctic Circle, Axel Heiberg Island. No trees have grown there for thousands and thousands of years. And in the ground on this island in Canada, this article reports forests of the past. It actually has 20 layers of of forest on top of each other. Each layer takes thousands and thousands of years to grow. So uh, that's just one of them, uh, so many examples that say there's a lot of evidence that this earth is very, very old. Now, if you grew up in church, you may have been heard or taught that the earth is five to 7,000 years old. And if you didn't grow up in church, that sounds really weird to you. But um, if you trace that idea back, where do we get that idea from? It's from a man named Bishop Usher, who lived in the 17th century. And what he did was he, he calculated the genealogies of the Bible. And so if Jesus was born at 0 AD, right, that's what marks Anno Domini, the years of our Lord from before Christ, BC, then you take up the genealogies and add them, out, add them up, and you get this number. Uh, the problem with that is that the genealogies in the Bible are theological creations telling us something about who we are and not necessarily uh, strict every generation, a strict family tree being given to us. And if you disagree with me on that, compare Matthew 1 and 2 Kings 8, okay? I'll leave you with that to look at. It means we we don't know how old the earth is. The the Bible at least doesn't tell us. This is not a science report. Now, did God create an old earth, right? A very old earth and put stuff in there for us to dig up? Maybe, maybe he made Adam as a human, as a growing man, right? But in humility, we have to say, we don't know. Now, I could go on so much about this. What I'd love for you to do, here's the second and last bit of homework. I've put on the website page where my message is found two incredible articles by great scholars, one named William Lane Craig, one named uh, Tim Keller, that go a little further about some of the contemporary questions from science and things like that that we have as soon as we read Genesis. And I encourage you to read those. They're very, very well written, great articles, because I could talk for a long time about what Genesis is not saying. What I want to do in the time we have left, I want to talk to you about what Genesis is saying, because the message of Genesis is amazing. And I'm going to suggest to you that it's even bigger and better than some of the questions that we have that don't get answered. Genesis is concerned with deeper questions than how the earth was made and when the earth was made. Genesis is concerned with why the earth is here. This is a better answer, right? Imagine I give you a present, and tomorrow on your driveway is like this really complicated machine with all these hoses and, you know, computer screens. What's your first question, if that's on your driveway? Is your first question, how long did it take to build that? You know, right? Your first question is, why are you giving me this, right? What does it do? And that's, when we come to the earth, when we come to our lives, the biggest question we have is why? Why am I here? What is it for? And Genesis 1 gives us some incredible answers into this question. Genesis 1 is a poem. It is an ancient song. It's an account of creation. It's an origin story that uses common elements from its day and age of other origin stories. You maybe didn't know that, but any time in their day and age when they heard a story that involved the waters, a snake, 
uh, a tree, a tree of life, other creation stories that are going to show up in further weeks of this series, in Genesis 2 and 3, we're going to look at those things. People in that day and age would have heard, oh, they would have heard that and they said, this is a story about my origin. This is a story about creation. Let me show you some images from surrounding cultures. This is from the Syrian people, okay? Don't look too close at the male and female anatomy, okay? You'll see that there. But what you have here is a tree, right? You have a tree, very similar to the Genesis stories, and you've got a snake that shows up in Genesis 3. This guy, notice he's killing the snake. He's stabbing the snake. Here's one from the Mari people, okay? What do you have here in this? There's a lot going on, so I'll explain it. There's a tree. There's a tree of life. Here you've got the waters again. What's this guy doing? He's stabbing the waters. I'll talk about that in a second. One more. This is from the Egyptian people. It's an Egyptian seal. Seals are things that kings or priests would use. They'd put into the clay, and it was kind of this telling of important things. And here you see the waters are actually becoming a snake, and this guy uh, is killing it here. Okay, so why do I show you that? Why do I show you these? Genesis uses common elements from origin stories in that day and age, thousands of years ago, but it tells us a very, 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 very different story than about who God is, about who we are, and why we're here. And I show you that just to say Genesis 1 was not written in a vacuum. It was written in time and space to a very specific people. And it is absolutely written for us, but it was not originally written to us. It was written to a different people group that we have to interpret in its context, right? And so what is he, you, know, you see that and you say, who is he writing to? Who is he writing for? What is he writing for? What's his purpose? And who is he writing against? We can't start with our own modern questions. Now, before I get into what it is saying, let me just give you uh, one bit of help as you go to read this. Maybe you've heard it said to you that Genesis 1 and 2 contradict. Because I said earlier, right, they have this people being created, humans being created before and after vegetation. You can only say that Genesis 1 and 2 contradict if you have not read the rest of the Bible. Because when you read the rest of the Bible, you see a number of times where two accounts are given for one historical event. In, in, in Exodus 14 and 15, In 14, you have this account where the people of Israel, these slaves, are delivered through the Red Sea. And it's the historical details. But then in chapter 15, you have Miriam's song, the first song in the Bible. And she speaks of the same event in incredibly beautiful poetic language. In Judges 4 and 5, right? Judges is this book where God's people are in the land and he he elevates these rulers, these judges, to protect his people. One of these elevated rulers is a woman named Deborah. And she fights against a guy named Sisera. And in Judges 4, you have an account of the battle she won. But then in Judges 5, you have another account of the same historical event, but it's a song. And in this song, she says, the stars in the heavens fought against Sisera. Now, what is she saying? That a comet came down and like nailed? No, right? She's giving this very poetic event, excuse me, poetic uh, description of the same event. And so you have two genres speaking of one significant historical event. You have a historical description, and you have a song about the significance of this. It's not contradictory. It's beautiful. It's brilliant. And that is exactly what you have when you open the Bible. You have Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, It starts with a poem about the significance of this, and then it goes on to probably much more likely a literal telling of kind of how this went along. Now, that being said, I hope you read this for yourself. What we can all agree Genesis is teaching us. Here are two, I want to give you two life-changing ideas from the book of Genesis. The first one it tells us is that God is sovereign over this entire universe. We serve a God, nothing is outside of his knowledge, nothing is outside of his control. In any of the other creation accounts, when this was written, you have multiple gods, and um, there are always multiple centers of power that are fighting each other, and all these ancient religions often, all of them worship the sun and the moon. And, and here in the account of creation, in the Genesis account, all elements of nature are created. And Genesis 1 gives us a demythologized picture of life. God alone is sovereign. God alone is worthy of our worship. God alone is the one that is reigning in control. And in the second verse, if you've ever opened your Bible, this is the second verse that you come, come to. Uh, now the earth was formless and empty. We're going to come back to that in a moment. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And it says the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The first readers would have been blown away by that statement because the waters in ancient times represented not so much the the H2O molecule, it represented chaos. 
And, and you saw in those seals, those images I showed you, these guys always fighting the snake that became water. Throughout the, the Bible, this is even is picked up, this image, that the sea represents chaos and destruction. And, and for all of the surrounding cultures in which this was originally written, the destiny of the world had to be decided every year or for the Egyptian people every day. And they had to fight, the, the, their God had to fight the forces of chaos, the sea, and, and like, they had to beat him down. And Genesis 1 opens, and here is God. It says a very different perspective. It says, no, 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 this isn't something God has to fight every day. God is sovereign forever over chaos. And in his power and his might, he reigns. Psalm 29 is commentary on chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis. And it says, The Lord sits enthroned over the waters, over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. What is this telling us? There is no chance that chaos, that destruction, that anything will happen that is outside of God's control. He's so far above that. Please realize, if you realize what it's saying, the entire worldview of the ancient world is dismantled in the first two verses of the Bible. It says, no, 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 you, you, every, this is how you see the world is wrong. The entire religious belief of all these peoples is dismantled. Genesis 1 says there's one God and he reigns supreme. And this theme is picked up on through the entire Bible. In fact, in the very last chapters of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, John's vision, he has this new heaven. This is a, a, a new earth. For the first heaven, the first earth has passed away. And he says there's no longer any sea. What is he saying? doesn't mean that there's no water skiing in heaven. He's saying, he's picking up on this idea from Genesis 1, that the potential for chaos is gone. There is no longer any disorder in this new world. But right now, that's something we look forward to in the future, but right now, Genesis 1 says, God is enthroned over the waters. He's enthroned over chaos. He sits sovereign over these things. One day that will be totally removed. Imagine if you adopted the worldview of Genesis 1, verse 2. That God is enthroned. The Spirit of God hovers over these waters. What would that mean to you today? No fear, right? Confidence. That I, we, I serve a God who reigns, that nothing is outside of his control, and my life is right in the palm of his hand. Now this goes on, and, and it tells us, not only is God sovereign, but in his sovereignty, he's created an order to this universe. It's not random. There's a way that this world works. Genesis 1, 2, it said, the earth is formless, and empty. In Hebrew, the language this is written, it's a fun phrase to say. It's tohu wabohu, formless and empty, wild and waste. There is this nothingness, and all of a sudden God speaks, and the chaos becomes a cosmos. A cosmos is a word that means we live in a well-ordered universe. I think that's pretty hard to argue. If you want to land a rover on Mars, you don't shoot where Mars is, right? You can calculate that it's going to be over here in two years. So you launch the rocket this way, that we live in a cosmos, a well-ordered universe. And to come under God's word, Genesis is saying, is to go from disorder to order. And many of us can speak how that's been true in our lives, where we had our own way and did our own thing, and life was kind of coming apart at the seams. But then we came under God's word and his authority, and boom, our lives began to make sense. We began to follow his ways. Now I'll just show you one thing that's a little bit technical, but it speaks to the outline what you have going on, if you're to read the whole chapter of Genesis, is problem, preparation, population. Here's a problem. Right? The world is described as darkness, abyss, formless. And these words here <clears throat> are, are uh, tohu is the word for unformed. What does God do? He prepares the earth. He forms it. Bohu is this Hebrew word for unfilled. God doesn't like this. He's created this world to be inhabited. And so then to deal with the un uninhabited and void nature of the earth, he fills it with sun, moon, stars, birds, fish, animals, humans. All of this is done by a God who says, be fruitful and multiply. I've blessed you to live in this earth, to live in this creation. And if you read through Genesis 1, the word God, the name God, appears over 30 times. Like there's just nothing that happens outside of his control. He overshadows the text. He, he dominates the text. And it's this extreme repetition is helping us to understand that the point that John will later make as he opens the gospel, it says, through him, through God, through Christ, all things were made. And everything he touches is good and pleasing. And it teems with life. And nothing is outside of his control. He is sovereign. He's made this earth. There's a grain to this universe that, that if you follow that, life will go well for you. What does this mean for us to be followers of a God who Genesis 1 says is sovereign? Confidence, peace, no fear, right? 
But there's a second thing it means. A second major point being made by Genesis 1 is this idea. You are here on purpose. You're not an accident, right? It, it, it's, it's this incredible statement that says you have been placed here by a loving God. You've been handcrafted. That your life is not an accident. One of the first messages of the Bible we run into is that you're not here by accident. You matter. Every day of your life matters. Your decisions matter. Your choices matter. In every other creation story of the surrounding cultures where Genesis was written, the, the world is kind of an afterthought. It's kind of a derivative. And the gods fought, and this was a part of their body. And, and it's kind of interesting. You've heard me say this a few times this past year, if you've been here, but it's true that um, ancient pagan creation stories are similar to modern explanations of how the world got here because they both say you're here by accident, right? In ancient stories, it's the gods fighting, but modern, right, modern scientific explanation for why we're here says it's just this big accident, you know, like where it's a big universe and some molecules collided and what do you know? All of a sudden there's life, you know, and it wasn't meant to be here, but this random chance. Both say you're here by accident. And Genesis speaks to us as clearly as it did these first people when it says you are not an accident. You are the reason a universe exists. God created the universe because he wanted company. He wanted to know and be known by you. That's why we're here. You've been made to be in relationship with God. You're not an accident. You were created by an all-powerful God. Genesis is written to oppose these, you know, these pagan stories, but I think it speaks so powerfully to us as well. In the dominant view of our world that says, you know, we're just here because blind forces and the, you know, the, the, things collided and there was an accident. There was a, uh, a series on PBS a number of years ago that you maybe saw, it was called A Glorious Accident. And it was this idea, this whole universe is just this glorious accident. We're here because of a random process of explosions and stars and, you know, matter collided and life began. All of us have seen accidents. I, and I've, never seen, I've never seen a glorious accident, you know? I've never seen an accident in an auto plant and a hybrid SUV drove out, you know, right? You ever seen that? No, you know? Do you remember there was a big explosion at a factory in St. Boniface? Like, it was like about, I think about 10 years ago. There was like explosions, it, it happened. Do you know that a Learjet came out of that explosion? Right? It just like, it can fly and it's got, you find that ridiculous, right? But can I say something to you that you as a human being are infinitely more complex than a Learjet. That sounds hard to believe, but it's true. You are infinitely more complex. Philosophers for some time now have been talking about the fine-tuning of the universe. That there are just so many variables that had to be in perfect, perfect set numbers for this world to exist. You, you can look that up. Look up the fine-tuning, just the list of the Earth's axis and the speed of rotation, all of these things. Without that, life wouldn't exist. And what it leads to us is this idea that it is mathematically impossible we're here by chance. Many, many philosophers are saying that. The hardest philosopher I had to read in university was an atheist. His name was Antony Flew. Very good writer, smart guy. And he actually became a theist not that long ago before he died. And he wrote a book called There Is a God. And people said, well, why do you believe there's a God now? And he said, the, the evidence leads there. Like, it's just too impossible for this world to exist by random chance. I'm going to give you one example of this, okay? If you step back from the complexities of our universe and just think of one molecule of protein in your body, that molecule of protein is made up of strands of amino acids that have to sequence in a very specific way. Just Google this when you get home. You can Google the probability of one of those sequencing in proper order on its own. If you were to fill 100 million planets and let just those planets be covered in those amino acids, there's many strands of amino acids in your body, but just let those 100 million planets interact with just those acids for 100 million years, the chance that those would sequence in the proper form would still be zero. I'm not talking about your skeletal system, okay? I'm not talking about your vascular system. I'm not talking about how they interact with your respiratory system or your nervous system. I'm not talking about ecosystems. I'm not talking about the solar system. I'm just talking about one string of protein. If you step back and think of us, I think all of us can realize we are not here by chance. And Genesis says it's far more than chance. You are lovingly put here by an all-powerful God. And Isaiah records this. God's saying, I am your creator. You were in my care even before you were born. Even before you were born, there's a creator. We're going to leave you with a song in a few moments that says, Before he spoke creation, the God of heaven knew our names. He knew the details of our life. It's amazing. If we believe this, if we believe this verse, the implications are that you have always been wanted. 
Since before time began, God wanted you to be alive. He knew about the details of your life. Genesis 1 tells us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. That quotes one of the Psalms that says God has put detail and and a plan and a purpose into how you were built and how you were created. It means you have value. We're going to look at this next week. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? That you have intrinsic value. Value built into you that can never be taken away. Despite what happens to you. Despite how you're treated. And it says you're not an accident, okay? There are accidental parents. Okay? There are no accidental babies, okay? God knew you were coming. God had a plan for you. And Genesis 1 teaches us that you're loved. Paul would write about this very idea as he writes to the church in Ephesus, and he said this, long before he laid down earth's foundations, God had us in mind, and he settled on us as the focus of his love. You have been made by God so that he could love you and that you could love him and know him. That's why you're here. So, what do we do with that? What does that mean to us today? If that's true, how, how do we know and enjoy God? There's this, there's this great document from the church called the Westminster Catechism. And a catechism was a way you would learn faith. And uh, one of the beautiful questions in this catechism says, what's the chief end of human life? And then the answer is to know God and enjoy him forever. Why are we here? What's the chief end of human life? To know God and enjoy him forever. And so how do we do that? Let me give you two thoughts from Genesis. One's just a small way. Another one's a main way. The first one's this. When you understand that God is the creator, you believe in the goodness of all created things. Genesis 1 means that God is not just interested in what we call religion, but God is interested in everything because he created everything. God is interested in agriculture. He's interested in architecture, in building, in farming, in aeronautics, in chemistry, in economics, in education. He's interested in engineering and medical studies and pharmacy. God is interested in everything because he created everything. Do you know that there are over 5,000 species of sponge on the ocean floor? Like if I was the creator, I might have stopped at like 14 or something, you know? But God created over 5,000. Do you know that there are over 300,000 species of beetle on the earth? Like that's that's an incredible creator God, right? There are multitudes of flowers, trees, animals, beautiful, odd, amazing. Creation reveals the unsearchable power and wisdom and even sense of humor of God, right? As you look at fireflies and stink beetles and platypuses, right? There's a God who would make these things. And so please understand, God is the creator. If you properly understand Genesis 1, God as the creator is an invitation to art. It's an invitation to wonder, to science, to awe. And it's an invitation to science. Wherever there's a new scientific discovery, we as followers of God are free to follow wherever that goes. And we can just say, oh, that's how God did it. You know, and there's a new discovery. That shouldn't shake our faith. Our faith is based on the resurrection that we celebrated last week. And there's a new scientific discovery. We just say, oh, that's how God did it. That's how the molecules came together. Because Genesis 1 doesn't really tell us that. Second main way we enjoy God, and this is the last thing I'll leave you with, just a thought on this. The way we are invited to know God in Genesis 1 is this idea of Sabbath. Shabbat shalom. Sabbath. Stop. And um, Genesis 1 ends with rest. And this is not so much about God resting because he was weary, and it's like, whew, created all that. No, no, no. This is God resting because he's sovereign. And there's nothing that can threaten his authorities. And, and there's numerous, numerous references to Sabbath in Genesis 1 that I won't go into. But I want you to think about this. Um, Genesis 1 is about the creation of this world. Who was there to see it? Right? No one was there to say it. Well, this is revelation. This is God revealing it to us. A tradition holds that it was first revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai, that he was given there. Now, if you are leading the people of Israel and you're Moses, who is the first audience that Genesis 1 is given to? It's given to people who are very recently slaves in Egypt, making bricks, right? That's what they were given to do. When you're a slave, you're valued based on your work, based on your productivity. And the first message of Genesis 1 is a message of Sabbath, rest, saying you're able to rest because your value is not based on your work and the number of bricks you make, but your value is based in being a creation of God, a child of God, regardless of how rich you are, how successful you are, how profitable you become, how early your, your retirement is. No, no, no. Your value is based on God, and we're invited into Sabbath. We're invited into rest because he's in charge of our lives. He's ultimately the one in control. 
And so very specifically for us, what does Sabbath look like? We rest, we play, no work. God loves us, right? Why do we have a day like that? Because we recognize as hard as I'm working and as smart as I am and as talented as I am, ultimately God's my provider. It's not just about me working, working, working on my kingdom to get early retirement or a nicer house or whatever. This life is about knowing God. We have been made to know God and enjoy him forever. And so we can take a day. We can take a time out and realize, I don't have to work sun up to sundown every day. This life is about knowing God. Jesus said that Sabbath is a gift of God made for humans. We have not been made. Humans have not been made to honor the Sabbath. The Sabbath has been made as a gift to us so that work would not overcome us, that we'd pause to focus on God. It's a gift to remember we are valued by God not because of what we do or achieve, but simply because of who we are, his people, his creation. Genesis 1 ends, and the seventh day just kind of hangs out there. It, it, most of the other, all the other days, the first six days begin and end, and seventh day doesn't end. It's kind of left there hanging. That We are given the invitation to join in on, and we are called to enter into this worldview and join God in Sabbath. Why can I be at rest today? Because God's in control. He's the one who's sovereign over this world. And if I believe that, if that's the center of my worldview, what do I have to worry about, right? What do I have to worry about? Imagine that came to rest in your heart and soul today with all the things that stress you out and you're worried about for the future, with your family, with your money. This invitation to Sabbath is a way to say, I can stop because I'm not the one that's ultimately in control. And this other six days, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to work hard. But the seventh day, I'm going to rest because God is in charge. And we're called to enter this worldview of God rejoicing over creation and resting. That's what we can do today. That's the invitation given to us from Genesis 1. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these incredible accounts of your creation. And uh, we just confess that we're not very good at this. So often we get tied up in the idea that our future and our lives are in our hands and what we can do. And um, I pray that you would remind us today that you are a creator God who's all-powerful. And you've created us in this way where you know the details of our lives. You know all about us. And we're invited into this relationship of trust. And so would you help us? Help us people who just sometimes we white-knuckle this life so hard. And we hold on and we're trying to force things. Lead us into a posture of rest in you. For people here today that's been working, 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 help them to enter into a lifestyle of Sabbath of rest because you're in charge. You're in control. We just confess we're not very good at this. And so we pray that you would lead us on into better ways. Lead us on into greater knowledge of you. Thank you for these accounts that tell us why we're here and what life is all about. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
creation, the God of heaven, knew your name. That's the amazing message of Genesis 1. And I hope you leave here today just incredibly encouraged by that truth. If God's at work in your heart, take action. Do what you need to do to get right with him, to take a next step. If we can help with that, talk to people at guest services or our prayer team that's down here. I invite you back next week for part two of Genesis series next week. We look at what does it mean to be made in the image of God? What does that mean for us as people? Go in the great peace that is ours as followers of a sovereign Lord. Take care, everyone.